Hi, my name is Kathy English. I am the curator of Revelstoke Museum and Archives. And I'm here today with Laura Stovall, the author of Swift River. And we're here to do a talk called, We Are Still Here, The Extinction and Return of the Snakes. As we begin, we acknowledge the four First Nations who lived in and stewarded the land around Revelstoke, the Snakes, the Sequipmik, the Okanagan Silk, and the Tanaha. We remember the children who were found buried at the Kamloops Residential School and the Maryville School in Kawasas, Saskatchewan, and all those children who were killed and harmed at the schools. I've been reflecting on how quickly and easily the Sinaiqs people were erased from the landscape of this region. People growing up in, the, in Revelstoke in the early 1900s, such as historian Ruby Nobbs, who was born here in 1907, had no knowledge of the Sinaiqs or of the fact that they had lived in this place for thousands of years. Growing up in Castlegar, it was the same situation. I knew nothing of the Sinaiqs presence in that region. It became easy to create a narrative that there had never been an indigenous presence in Revelstoke, other than people casually traveling through for hunting and fishing. It is an honor to me to be among those who are helping to tell the true story of this land. I am privileged to have worked with Virgil Seymour, the former Arrow Lakes coordinator for the Colville Confederated Tribes, and with Shelley Boyd, who currently holds that position. The Sinaiqs First Nation, also referred to as the Lakes Indians or the Arrow Lakes Indians, were interior Salish, are interior Salish. Their name means people of the place of the bull trout. Their language is shared with, many, with small variations by many nations, including the Okanagan. Their territory comprised the Columbia River from south of the US border, approximately at Kettle Falls, Washington, up to Revelstoke and possibly beyond, and the area of the Kootenai River up to Nelson and the Lardo, as well as the Slocan Valley. It's really important to realize that 80% of their territory was in Canada and 20% in the United States. They were a hunter, fisher, gatherer society. They weren't nomadic, but they performed seasonal rounds in the spring, summer, and fall to harvest food and to hunt. These maps from the book, Geography of Memory, show some of the village sites, fisheries, burial sites, and pictograph sites in uh, some, of the, the, some of their territory. Over the last few years, an archeological field school has been in place on the Slocan River near Lemon Creek, led by Nathan Goodale and Alyssa Nauman of Hamilton College in New York. They have done extensive research on the uh, pit house sites and uh, archaeological sites in that region. And their research points to habitation up to 6,260 years ago based on carbon dating. Archaeologist Nathan Goodile suggests that th these indigenous groups were highly mobile foragers with no permanent settlements. And then there's an unexplained gap in their evidence of human habitation beginning around 4,260 years ago and continuing for about 400 years. That gap seemed to separate an early foraging culture from a later more settled period, which involved more specialized food gathering and processing and preserving of food. And from about 3,860 years ago, the Snakes began to live in single or low density clusters in the upper Columbia region. They've, they've uncovered both large and small pit houses, some, in, some dating back to well over 3,000 years. And uh, in later, uh, in, from a slightly later or more recent period, there's evidence of larger, more complex villages. One village was located in the Big Eddy area of Revelstoke, close to the Tum Tum or Tonkawatla River, Skuhikin was the name of the, the village there. In uh, the early 1900s, anthropologist James Tate visited, uh, was speaking to uh, 
in the Sinaiq's people, and he ended up writing the book, The Salishan Tribes of the Western Plateaus, uh, 1927 to 1928. And in his work, he said that the village was on the creek opposite the present town of Revelstoke. He said, the place is said to have been the headquarters of a rather large band, which was reinforced at certain seasons by people from lower down the Columbia. It was noted as a trading, trapping, hunting, burying, and salmon fishing center. Their winter sites generally comprised 50 to 200 people and consisted of subterranean pit houses. James Tate interviewed members of the Christian family near Castlegar, and he was told that the Snipes territory extended beyond Revelstoke. He wrote, the only part seemingly in doubt is the extreme north, the old Revelstoke band having been much mixed with Shushwap. Said the Sequipmec were always on good terms with the lakes and often hunted and fished with them. Last year, I came across an article in the Revelstoke Review uh, while well, I was doing my uh, research for the uh, glimpses of the past column. And in the fall of 1930, there was an article about a local man who had found a spear, which he described as an arrow, at the summit of Mount Revelstoke. He said it was on the ground near a snow patch that had just recently melted, and he'd sent it to the Royal Ontario Museum. We inquired about it and were sent this, these photos of the spear, still in the collection of the museum, we have always known or certainly sur surmised that the indigenous people, the Sinaiqs, and probably the Sequemec as well were using Mount Revelstoke. But this was the first tangible evidence that we had of the indigenous presence high, up, high on Mount Revelstoke. In 1935, the anthropologist William Elmendorf interviewed Sinaiqs elder Nancy Weinkoop. She stated that the lakes originally settled around Revelstoke, retreating south around the 1830s. She claimed that the earliest settlement of lakes was Nicomaplex, which was most likely at the mouth of the Nkomaplu River near Comaplex. We often think of hunter-gatherer societies as being random in their food gathering, but they managed the berry and root crops by rotating harvesting sites over a cycle of two to three years and by burning the land in places to promote the crops. Their staples included huckleberry, uh, roots, such as camas and bitterroot, and other plants and berries. They constructed portable shelters for their seasonal rounds. They hunted game meats, deer, elk, moose, caribou, uh, bear, and others. And after the coming of the horse, they also ventured east after bison. The caribou herds were immense at that time with more than 100 animals per herd. The Snyaks trained dogs to drive deer towards the Columbia River, where hunters in canoes shot them with bow and arrow. Salmon was an important part of the lives of the Snyaks. Kettle Falls, Washington, at the southern end of the Snyaks territory, was a major salmon fishery shared by several First Nations. In late June, flotillas of Snyaks canoes would head south to Kettle Falls for the arrival of the first salmon. The Squelpi or Colville village at that site would swell from around 150 people to almost 1,000 by July. Salmon fishing was governed by the salmon chief, a Squelpi man who decided when the salmon could be caught, how much could be taken, and how it would be distributed. Artist Paul Kane came to the Columbia in 1847, and he observed the fishery at Kettle Falls. He wrote, no one is allowed to catch fish without his permission. His large fishing basket or trap is put down a month before anyone is allowed to fish for themselves. He said that around 400 salmon were caught each day on average. At the end of each day during the first month, the salmon chief supervised the distribution of the salmon to the women who processed them and prepared them for drying. Paul Kane wrote, everyone, even to the smallest child, received an equal share of the first month's catch. The salmon chief explained to Kane, infinitely greater numbers of salmon could be readily taken here if it were desired. But as the chief considerately remarked to me, if he were to take all that came up, there would be none left for the Indians on the upper part of the river so that they content themselves with supplying their own wants. The salmon chief also ensured that larger numbers of the strongest salmon 
were able to swim upstream to spawn. Salmon fishing on the Columbia was stopped with the completion of the Grand Coulee Dam in the 1940s. And all of the nations who had relied on that fishery for so long had a gathering called the Ceremony of Cheers where they mourned the loss of the salmon. The Sinaiks used a distinctive sturgeon nose canoe. It was about 4.5 to five meters long with a cedar frame covered by large slabs of white pine bark riding low in the water with downward sloping tips to reduce wind resistance. It was made of white pine and the Sinaiq's name for the white pine tree translates to bark canoe wood. The uh, explorer David Thompson noted the special design of the canoe that was sloped down to lie flat on the water. Thompson noted that it was sturdy and large enough to hold six people but could be easily carried on the shoulder of one person during a portage. The anthropologist James Tate commissioned a canoe to be built by six men living near present day Brilliant Dam near Castlegar. Bark for the tree was peeled in May and by the time Tate returned in July, the canoe was finished. The explorer David Thompson and uh, his uh, explorers came through what is now Revelstoke in the fall of 1811. He was uh, uh, exploring and mapping the entire Columbia River, and that was what opened up the fur trade in this region. But at the time of the first European contact on this part of the Columbia River, their numbers had already been reduced from several thousands to just a few hundred people due to smallpox epidemics carried through intertribal trade. After Thompson's exploration and mapping of the Columbia River, the fur trade was opened up in this region with traders regularly traveling from Jasper over the Athabasca Pass to Bowdoin Campment at the top of the big bend of the Columbia River from where they traveled south as far as Fort Colville, which was established by the Hudson's Bay Company at Kettle Falls. In early May of, 19, of 1814, the fur trader Gabriel Franchere traveled with a Northwest Company fur trade brigade of 10 canoes up the Columbia. At a site which was probably Squihican or Big Eddie, he came across a Sinaik's camp and saw, in his words, women spinning the coarse wool of the mountain sheep. They had blankets or mantles woven or plaited of the same material with a heavy fringe all around. He wanted to buy a blanket, but uh, didn't because they had to carry their baggage on their backs and he couldn't manage the extra weight. Although Franchere called it a mountain sheep, it was more likely a mountain goat. The botanist David Douglas, after whom the Douglas fir is named, traveled up the Columbia River with a Hudson's Bay Company Brigade in April 1827 and near the upper end of Lower Arrow Lake came across a camp of three families from whom they bought three pairs of snowshoes. He saw in his words, not fewer than a hundred skins, largely of caribou, which are killed readily during the deep snow with the bow. Douglas and his companions met many Sinaiq's people and remarked on their distinctive sturgeon nose canoes. He also saw Sinaiq's women gathering lichen from pine trees to make a sort of bread cake. In 1838, the first Catholic priests came to the region. They traveled with the fur trade brigade over the Athabasca Pass to Bowdoin Campment and down the river. They stopped at House of the Lakes which we believe to be the site of the Arrowhead town site. Priest Francis Norbert Blanchette wrote, the Indians of the lakes came to visit the priests, anxious as they were to see and hear the black gowns so often spoken of by the Canadians. They were found to be of a mild, peaceable character and well disposed to hear the words of salvation. The Indians listened with attention, assisting at mass with awe. And before the return of the boat, they brought their children, 17, to be baptized, regretting not to have the same happiness to make their hearts good. It was painful to the missionaries to leave them unbaptized. At the end of the quote from Blanchette. Of course, it's clear from their writings and their correspondence that they considered the indigenous people to be savages and baptizing them was erasing them and erasing their own spirituality and their cultural practices. The act of baptism though, 
conferred English names on the Sinaiq's people. And this allowed for the recording of names and family history. This tracking of family names became crucial for the Sinaiq's when they were establishing their traditional ties to this territory. James Bernard was the chief of the Sinaiq uh, nation in the Kelly Hills area near Colville for over 30 years until his death in 1934. He attended a Senate hearing of the Colville delegation in Washington, DC, and he responded to a Senator who told him that before the white men came, the indigenous people had nothing and that they were naked and starving. Here is part of his response. Before the coming of the white man, our resources on this continent, if we could sum it up, had a value we could never put into figures and dollars. Our forests were full of wild game, our values covered with tall grass. We had camas, huckleberries and bitter root and wild flowers of all kinds. When I walked out under the stars, the air was filled with the perfume of the wild flowers. In those days, the Indians were happy and they danced day and night, enjoying the wealth created by the almighty God for the Indians use as long as he lived. Now I'll turn the talk over to Laura Stovall. Thank you, Kathy. And it's a pleasure to tell my part of the story to you all. And um, it's, a, it's a sad story. It's a story about how the, what led to the declaration that the uh, Sinaiqs were extinct as a band in Canada. Um, but it also ends with optimistic notes um, talking about the Sinaiqs return. When Britain and the United States agreed upon the 49th parallel as the border between the lands they claimed in the Pacific Northwest, no indigenous group people were consulted. The Treaty of Oregon signed in 1846 resolved the challenges of 10 years of joint occupancy by the two superpowers. But for indigenous peoples whose land and trade routes were dissected by the boundary, the results were devastating. Sinaiqs were especially, Sinaiqs were especially hard hit by the border which eventually gave BC settler governments an excuse to deny their land rights and led them to being pushed out of this valley. Eventually the federal government declared them to be extinct in 1956. I want to talk about how this happened and a bit about Sinaik's efforts to return to their homeland. So here you can see a map of the Columbia River and the boundary cutting the lower portion of Sinaik's territory where you can see the black rectangles and numbers um, all the way up north. The international boundary did not affect Indigenous people much at first, at least while the fur trade was strong and Indigenous people were the main fur suppliers. At this time, the Sinaik's chief, Kisuli or Gregoire, had very good relations with officials at Fort Shepherd the Hudson Bay Company fort built just north of the new border. The situation facing the Sinaiqs became much trickier, however, and Kasuli would need all his considerable diplomatic and negotiating skills to protect his people. In 1858, gold was discovered on the Fraser River and many Americans headed north. In 1861, American gold seekers became interested in the Columbia River and the Big Bend area. Gold Commissioner William George Cox was asked to facilitate passage by a group of miners who wanted to head north. He told miners to remain at Fort Shepherd while he talked with the indigenous people of the area. At the southern end of Lower Arrow Lake, he spoke separately with Sinaiqs and Tanaha leaders, telling them about the miners coming into the area and promising them that indigenous people and miners would have treated equal protection um, under the law. First, Cox arranged for Sinaik subchiefs Quiquilasket and Melchior to uh, accompany the miners on their way north. Kisule was away hunting, so he did not speak to him. He then spoke with the Tinaha. This was a time when reserves were being established in BC. Under Governor James Douglas, 
who anticipated that miners would just snatch up the land. Indigenous leaders were asked to mark out their terrain and reserves based on these were much larger and more consolidated than they later became. Interestingly, the Tanaha asked Cox to mark land at Capitals at the confluence of the Kootenai and Columbia rivers, land that was closely tied to the, um, to the Christian family, the Sinaik's Christian family, who I'll talk about later. We don't know why Quiquilasket and Melchior didn't ask for land, except that Cox may not have mentioned that possibility to them. And also, it's not clear why uh, no reserve ever ended up being created at Capitals. During the 1860s, Fort Shepherd records changed from a focus on the fur trade to a focus on mining. Indigenous people stopped being important and they were rarely mentioned in the records. What we do know is that thousands of miners and related business people made their way up the Columbia River to the Big Bend area. Many of them came in overloaded, inadequate boats and many lost their lives or had to be rescued by Indigenous people, especially in the dangerous rapids along the way. I suspect that the influx of miners in the 1860s led some Sinaiks to spend more time in the southern portion of their territory, where they had security in larger numbers. Sinaiks families tended to be small and more dispersed than other nations, including their more settled cousins, the Scoelpi or Colville tribe at Kettle Falls. When Governor D Douglas retired in 1864, a much more settler-oriented government replaced him. The BC Chief Commissioner of Land and Works, Joseph Trutch, sought to reduce Douglas era reserves and push wagon, wagon roads to the gold fields as quickly and cheaply as possible. In 1865, Trutch sent Walter Moberly, then Assistant Surveyor General for BC, to survey possible wagon roads over the mountains between the Shuswap and Okanagan uh, regions and the Columbia. Moberly is well recognized for identifying the Eagle Pass west of Revelstoke as a suitable route between the Columbia River and the Shushua. This and other routes identified by him and his assistants were existing indigenous trails. Here in this picture, you see um, a miner, Gus Headstam, and you also see a boat at Priest Rapids where um, a serious accident took place that uh, is talked about in my book. The writings of Moberly and his assistant, James Turnbull, show that the Snikes and Chief Kasuli were still very much in control of the Arrow Lakes and Revelstoke region. Um, this is a sketch of uh, Chief of the Lakes by Paul Kane in um, 1846. And Kane met this man up just below Downey Creek uh, as, as he was heading north with a brigade. Uh, Based on the description, this may be uh, Kasuli, and if so, it's a very significant drawing. Um, it would be the only uh, image that we have of him, and you can see he's in a sturgeon nose canoe. Um, Kasuli was ready to assist uh, Moberly's assistant Turnbull in traveling up the Columbia from Lower Arrow Lake to present day Revelstoke until Turnbull refused to pay his Okanagan guides who had led him over the Monashies. After that, Turnbull had to pay dearly for every bit of assistance going up river. So you could see at that point that the Snikes still had, had power and control. Uh, when Turnbull met Moberly at the Begetti, Kasuli stopped by. He and Moberly had a long conversation um, that night and again the next evening. Moberly uh, referred to the Snikes as Columbia Indians, still recognizing their connection with the region. With the help of the Sinaiks and Shaquemic guides, uh, Moberly explored the Illa River, a misinterpretation of the Sinaiks name Silawitkwa, or Big Water. He didn't make it all the way up to what would be later named Rogers Pass, but he identified it as a possible route for road east. In 1872, after a series of wars with indigenous peoples, the US government established the Colville Reservation, and you can see it here just south of the border. The reservation, which forced um, together eight tribes, including the Sinaiks, 
was initially 3.1 million acres, far bigger and more consolidated than BC reserves. It ran right up to the Canadian border and included some Southern Sinaiq's territory. Many Sinaiq's families settled at Kelly Hill, uh, which Kathy mentioned just east of the border in um, this area over here, or actually that's number 30 there. Um, just south of the border. However, in 1891, due to set settler and minor pressure, the northern half of the reservation, 1.5 million acres, was uh, sold under dubious circumstances, forcing Sinaiqs to move again. They headed to many regions, including the Okanagan in Canada, and many settled around Inchalem, uh, down the lowest uh, rectangle here, um, beside the Columbia on the east side of the reservation where they remain to this day. Reserve land south of the border paradoxically led to worse conditions north of it. After the Colville Reservation was created, people north of the border began to refer to Sinaiqs as Colville or American Indians who had no place in BC. Sure, they might travel north to hunt and fish, but this was not their land. The only exception was the ill-defined Gregoire or Suli Indians. The Sinaiqs and their long attachment to this land could therefore be ignored while they remained in plain sight. In 1881, Major Albert Bowman Rogers and his nephew Albert hiked up to Rogers Pass, identifying it as a suitable route for the railway. There's a very, um, a very sad story that accompanied that, that hike and Roger, the Rogers don't come out well in that, um, but that's in my book and I don't have time to talk about it here. So clearing of the railway route began in 1883. And in the autumn of 1883, Sanford Fleming, lead, lead surveyor for the Canadian Pacific Railway and his party walked over Rogers Pass from the east and arrived in Skahican, also known as the Big Eddy. He was expecting to be met by a party from Kamloops, but instead met a band of Colville Indians. Thinking they were American, Fleming and his friends pondered whether they should ask them to help them travel north and then they could make their way west from there. I'm sorry, help them travel downriver to Kettle Falls um, and then they would make their way from there. In the end, sorry, I'm going to sneeze. Um, an older Sinaix man named Baptiste guided them expertly to the west end of Three Valley Lake and they continued to the Shushwap uh, from Eagle, down Eagle River. That was the last year that the Snikes would have known peace around Revelstoke. Baptiste may not have known that west of Three Valley Lake, Gustavus Blinn Wright was building a tote road from Sycamus to the Columbia. By the next uh, summer, the road reached the Big Eddy. By November 1885, when the last spike at, of the CPR railway was driven, Wright would have constructed a toll bridge over the Columbia River and the town of Farwell would have been, later Revelstoke, would have been built, burned down and rebuilt. For the Sinaiqs, nothing would be the same again. Wright was paid by the provincial government in land. He was granted 60,000 acres around the Big Eddy. The CPR was also granted substantial land on both sides of the railway and surveyor Arthur Stanhope Farwell, after whom the first uh, rent version of Revelstoke was named, um, bought a 32 kilometer strip of land along each side of the Columbia River. He had worked uh, for Moberly's survey party and spent that winter in the Big Eddy. So he had a hunch of what was about to happen and took advantage of it. In other words, even before the town of Revelstoke was created, the land being given away in large amounts was being given away in large amounts right from under the Sinaiqs with no recognition of their rights. The Sinaiqs continued to come to the Revelstoke area, often camping on islands on the river to avoid settlers, a practice that we first saw reported in 1884 as increasing numbers of them walked over Rogers, of men walked over Rogers Pass and camped in the Big Eddy, where the Sinaiqs had lived. Settler newspapers were hostile, accusing the Sinaiqs of being foreigners who overhunted in the area. Still, Sinaiqs continued to come to Revelstoke in the fall for their usual hunting and fishing. In 
At least in 1886 to 87, they overwintered just west of the Big Eddy. One Sinaik's man, who we will call Jim, worked for a rancher named Thomas Reed for eight months at Hall's Landing around 1886. Jim must have watched the continued encroachment of settlers and their claims of holding private property with alarm. Once he challenged a settler named Evan Johnson who was established a farm near Beaton, but Johnson had driven him off. On May 11th, 1894, Jim and his wife Adeline canoed to Galena Bay and met a, Sam, a settler named Sam Hill. According to Hill, Jim asked him what he was doing and Hill explained that he was planting potatoes. Jim replied that if Hill planted potatoes back there, he would take them, that this was his land, that Evan Johnson had stolen his land at the head of the arm and I was trying to steal this. But he said, I wouldn't, he would kill me first. Hill said, go to the Taiyi, Chinook jargon for chief, at Revelstoke. Jim said he didn't care for my Taiyi, but wanted me to go to his. While Jim and Adeline hiked up the creek to hunt, Hill left to get three friends, one to find the government agent and the other to stay with him. When Jim and Adeline returned that eve afternoon, Jim reportedly said, I told you to get away from here. Hill said he wouldn't. Both men grabbed their guns. As Adeline later was reported to testify in Hill's trial, Jim was holding the gun with the muzzle pointing up and to the left when Hill fired his gun. Jim ran away towards some trees and Hill fired again, wounding him. When Jill, Jim staggered and fell to the ground, Hill shot him dead. Hill told a slightly different story that both men fired at the same time and that after Jim fell, he covered him the third time whilst running up to take his rifle. Hill turned himself in to the justice of the peace. The newspaper strongly backed Hill. An article in the Kootenai Mail entitled, Killed an Indian, Sam Hill Sends a Bullet Through the Heart of Cultist Jim, began. The Columbia River and its tributaries have for generations past been the hunting grounds of a certain tribe of Indians known as the Colville Indians. Colville is in the domain of Uncle Sam and these Indians have no right or little to cross the boundary and hunt in British Columbia. But in view of the fact that their forefathers hunted here and looked upon both shores of the Columbia as their own special preserve, great laxity has always been allowed to them. And they hunted for 200 miles upriver from their own reservation at Colville. The camp of this tribe was right here in Revelstoke last summer and they killed caribou and smaller game all through the closed season, which white men are not for to, permitted to do. Predictably, Hill was acquitted, uh, acquitted on the grounds of self-defense. Adeline, who did not speak English, was not provided with an interpreter, so we do not know the accuracy of, her, uh, of the reports of her testimony. After the trial, Adeline returned to join her people. Remarkably, we now know that she lived to be 106 years old, passing away just in 1978. She always kept her language and inspired her great granddaughter, Lorraine Wiley, a prominent Nsilksen language teacher, to learn it. She's also the great grandmother of Patty Bailey, who taught cedar harvesting and basket weaving in Revelstoke, and who for 20 years worked for the Colville Confederated Tribes to try to force tech resources in trail to clean up the toxic effluent, the, sel the smelter released into the Columbia River over the past century. Strong women who descended from a woman terribly treated in this region. Pay attention to this photo. You may see its likeness around Revelstoke in the coming months. After Jim was killed, the newspapers printed sensational stories with allusions to murderous Sinaiks. In April 1895, the Kootenai Mail carried a long editorializing article entitled, Dangerous Colvilles, They Should Be Indicted in British Columbia. The article described efforts by J.F. Hume, MLA for West Kootenai South, to prevent Sinaiks people from hunting in BC. The article, if read from today's perspective, described attempts by Sinaiks to assert their rights to land by the current Revelstoke Airport, 
at Beaton, and this was both um, Jim and the Christian family who tried to uh, get their land near Beaton, near Shelter Bay, and even on an island in the river near Revelstoke, one of the last places where they felt safe. Oops. There we go. In 1896, the BC government passed an act to amend the Game Protection Act, making it unlawful for Indians not resident of this province to kill game at any time of the year. As Sinaiks were increasingly moving to the United States for their own protection, this law meant that if they hunted in Canada, they would be arrested and possibly prevented from crossing the border. This law would come into play in the Rick Dizitel court case, which I'll talk about later. For several reasons, the Sinaiks were not given a reserve when reserves were allocated back in the late 1800s. They were associated with the US and were therefore considered foreign. Some were called Gregoire Indians and those living in the Arrow Lakes and Kootenays were increasingly called Kootenay Indians, a name they, that some accepted, likely because it tied them to the region. At the same time, unknown to them, their land was being bought up by spec land speculators who were often government officials. In 1884, John Car Carmichael Keynes brought strategic land at Capitals at the confluence of the Columbia and Kootenai River, the land of the Sinaik's Christian family. Gilbert Malcolm Sprout bought Sinaik's land opposite, which was tied to the Sinaik's Joseph family. Neither of these families were informed of these purchases and because nothing happened to the land, they were not aware it had been sold from out from under them. The Indian agent RLT Galbraith was based in, in uh, Fort Steele in Tanaha territory, northeast of Cranbrook, further east. In 1901, almost 10 years after he became Indian agent, the provincial police contacted Galbraith after an elderly Snipes man was found dead near Castlegar. When Galbraith investigated, he met three or four Snipes families, including the Christians and the Josephs at Capitals. He also learned about other Arrow Lakes people who lived on Lower Arrow Lake near Burton. To make a long story short, in 1902, the tiny Arrow Lake Indian Reserve of less than uh, one square kilometer was created on rough land on the west bank of Lower Arrow Lake opposite and just south of Beaton. Uh, Burton, sorry. Um, Galbraith considered it to be a mixed band of Chequetmic, Colville, AKA Sinaiks, and Kootenai Indians numbering 26 members. In fact, 24 of them were likely Sinaiks. In my book, I discuss the evidence of that. It was a reservation destined for failure. The land was rough, inadequate, and not meaningful for the members. The members came from all along the Columbia and were not a socially cohesive group. Although Galbraith described Baptiste Clome as chief, there was no governance structure, no chief and council. Several of the people listed on the ban list never lived there, and some moved over to the Burton area quite quickly. Between 1902 and the early 1930s, most band members had died, several of uh, tuberculosis, and some had moved away. In 1936, the last member, Annie Joseph, who had moved to head of the Lake Reserve near Vernon, told the Vernon Indian agent that she had no knowledge of any survivor of the reserve except her, herself. In January 1953, Annie Joseph died, and in 1956, the Indian commissioner declared the band to be extinct. At that point, 257 members of the Colville Confederated Tribes were re registered as lakes or Sinaiks, and hundreds were living elsewhere, including the Okanagan Valley. Somehow, and very conveniently for the governments, a tiny inadequate reserve and the socially and politically incohesive group of people not even correctly identified who were offered a toehold of land on it became a proxy for a whole people, like a magic trick with shifting labels and predictable decline of the reserve and the predictable decline of the reserve inhabitants, the people and the Sinaiks disappeared from view. 
I show this picture of a baseball team because right at the top, at the back on the left is one of the, um, it's Martin Joseph and he, uh, or Martin Louis, sorry. And uh, he, his family moved over to Burton. They didn't stay on the reserve and they went to school in Burton. There were other opportunities to provide meaningful land to Sinaik's families in BC. In particular, the Christian family at Capitals. In 1902, Baptiste Christian asked Galbraith to protect their land. Galbraith said the land belonged to someone else and instead tried unsuccessfully to persuade the Christians to move to the Arrow Lake Reserve. The Christian family, Antuni, her three children, Baptiste, Alex, who's pictured here, uh, and Mary and their spouses and children had lived at Capitals as far back as they could remember. Their family members were buried there, but the request to have their land recognized fell on deaf ears. Only when the famous anthropologist James Tate visited them in 1909, 1910, and again in 1912, did the government officials begin to listen. Antuni and Mary were the knowledge keepers who informed Tate's research. After hearing their story, Tate advocated on their behalf with Indian Affairs in Ottawa. Responding to Tate's letter, a flurry of correspondence ensued between the governments in Ottawa and Victoria. The letters acknowledged the Christians' um, rights to the land and requested that a small portion be reserved for the family. At one point in 1910, Indian Superintendent Vowell in Victoria wrote, the department is quite aware that it's possible that the Indians may have a valid claim on account of long possession. It may, however, be difficult and expensive to establish the claim. It is therefore thought advisable to purchase it, if possible, 15 or 20 acres where the Indians reside. If this can be done for a reasonable sum, um, then it should be done. And he asked Galbraith to value the land and find the owner to try to make the deal. In other words, although both federal and provincial governments recognized the Christians' prior claim to the land, they bowed to expedience and would not cha challenge settler land titles or go really out of their way um, to secure the land for them. In May 1912, Tate received two heartbreaking letters from Antuni and Alex Christian. The letters said that they'd been given three weeks to leave the land. Tate had previously been ensured that the Christians would gain title to their land. Now they learned that Hayes, the Hayes estate had sold the land to the Duke of Wars who were looking for a place to settle. When Galbraith inquired whether the Duke of Wars uh, would sell the land back to the government for the Christians, the latter refused. In the end, they came to an arrangement that was satisfactory for the Department of Indian Affairs. The Christians could stay on two to three acres of the land as long as they stayed to themselves. The Duke of leader said, from our side, we will be good neighbors to them. The relationship between the Christians and the Duke of Wars deteriorated. In 1912, Alex Christian, with Tate's help, wrote to the Royal Commission on Indian Affairs in British Columbia to complain that the Duke of Wars had encroached on his land, damaged graves, and cleared fruit trees. The commission ruled in Alex's favor, stating that the reserve should be created for the family. Notably, they called him a Kootenai Indian, despite his statement that he was Sinaixed. Despite the commission's favorable finding, a damning report from the Vernon Indian agent uh, assigned to look into the reserve and the Duke of Bors refusal to sell the land was enough to undermine the claim. Chief Surveyor Bray in Ottawa said that nothing more could be done and the file was closed. The Christians stayed at Capitals for a few years longer and continued to harvest in the area. In 1924, after his wife Teresa died, Alex and their daughter Mary traveled to Omak, Washington. Alex Christian contracted tuberculosis and died shortly after. Although the Sinaiks were pushed out of the Columbia, some continued to hunt and gather in the north and paid attention to what was happening in their traditional lands. All right, that was his testimony um, on their traditional lands. In 1881, plans were in place to build a road across an ancient village site at Valakin in the Sokan. Sinaik's people traveled up from Washington 
to challenge the road construction. During that blockade, the anglicized version of the name Sinaixt was established. A group of Sinaixt stayed at Valakin, and one member in particular, Marilyn James, began to educate people in the valley about Sinaixt history. The group that stayed identified as separate from the Sinaixt in Washington, who were part of the Colville Confederated Tribes on the Colville Reservation. Beginning in, in 2008, the Colville Confederated Tribes became more active in BC. First, in 2008, the council created the position of the Arrow Lakes facilitator, um, a kind of a, a diplomatic post uh, that built relations with people in, in BC. The first facilitator was Jim Boyd, a well-known singer-songwriter. After Jim uh, stepped down uh, to become chief of the Colville Business Council, Virgil Seymour, who Kathy mentioned, was appointed. Virgil won the hearts, hearts all up the valley and loved Revelstoke. He visited schools, worked with Kathy English at the Revelstoke Museum on the Snikest exhibit, opened the storytelling festival in 2004 with Shelley Boyd, and organized language classes for his friends along the Columbia. Unfortunately, Virgil developed leukemia and passed away in June 2016. His successor was Shelley Boyd, who many are familiar with and who holds that position to this day. In 2010, the Colville Business Council of the Colville Confederated Tribes sent a traditional hunter, Rick Dizitel, to hunt an elk in BC with the purpose of being arrested. Rick um, Rick and his wife, Linda, harvested an elk and then phoned the conservation office. It took a few tries, but eventually Rick was cited for contra contravening the BC Wildlife Act for hunting big game while not being a resident. The case went to the BC Provincial Court in Nelson, where Dizitel's friend defense lawyers argued that these sections of the Wildlife Act did not apply to him. Um, because of Section 35.1 of the Constitution Act 1982. This section recognizes and affirms the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. At the trial, BC government lawyers argued that Section 35 does not apply to Dizitel because the Sinaiks never had Indigenous rights in Canada. They also argued that the Sinaiks gradually and voluntarily drifted away from their traditional practice of hunting in British Columbia in the BC portion of Sinaik's territory. Dizitel won the case, which the provincial government appealed to the BC Supreme Court and then the BC Court of Appeal, and eventually to the Supreme Court of Canada. This is a photo of um, them at the Supreme Court of, Can of Canada with lawyer um, Mark Underhill on the right and Rick on the left. Um, Dizitel, backed by the Confe Colville Confederated Tribes, won each time. At the Supreme Court of Canada, the Canadian government and almost all the provinces intervened on the side of the BC government, stating that Section 35.1 of the Constitution Act should not apply to American nationals who did not hold Canadian citizenship. A wide range of Indigenous organizations and nations, including the Okanagan Nation Alliance, intervened on the side of the Sinaiks, stating that this artificial boundary divided nations who still had an interest in their Canadian territories. The case, the case clearly had implications far beyond a single Sinaiks hunter or even the Sinaiks themselves. On April 23rd of this year, the Supreme Court of Canada decided in favor of Rick Dizitel. It was a great victory, but the full implications remain to be seen. Will governments and their institutions reach out in recognition and friendship to the Sinaiks, acknowledging the important role they play on the land? Or will they do the minimum, say this was just a hunting case and force the Sinaiks to continue to fight in the courts for consultation, a seat at the table, and meaningful partnership. The latter would be a continued injustice, expensive for all sides and a missed opportunity. The experience of many of us in Revelstoke has been with the generosity, kindness and wisdom of our Sinaiks and other indigenous friends. We have so much to gain from these relationships and I hope that our governments and their institutions will embrace them too.
this photo is of Adeline sitting in the front uh, with five generations of her family, including her, just a survivor and, and a real reflection of um, the Sinaites as survivors and the salmon as survivors. And when the strong efforts that indigenous people are bringing sat, are, are, are making to bring the salmon up the river. And I think um, the Sinaites really identify with that struggle too. Um, the last slide is uh, the title page of my book, Swift River. If you're interested in this story, um, you can, you can uh, buy my book or get it at the library. And I'd also encourage you to come to the Revelstoke Museum and Archives and enjoy the display, um, the wonderful Sinaiks display that they have right at the, uh, just as you step in the door of the, of the museum. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today.